Good evening. Uh, my name is John Michael Lannan. I'm a senior health, safety, and environmental advisor on construction sites. I've worked in construction most of my life. And one thing we need to do is, you know, the old people say there's two types of, what was Bob used to say, she was in Notre Dame Bay. There's two types of Newfoundlanders, ones that stand their ground and ones that stand aside. And it's better to stand up than give up. So everybody should stand up. We've been sitting for two hours. Stand up. <laughs> So I got three minutes. Uh, my first question, I got to get uh, something curious out of the way. Was there a tariff or a tax or a levy put on fast food? <laughs> Was there a health levy put on fast food? Because God knows there should be. Yeah. Right? Is that oh, yeah. Right? So I want to know that. I want to know if there's, there's a tariff going on. Uh, there should be a health tariff put on fast food. But anyways, uh, my situation is, of course, I've worked in this industry for decades, and I got a big roll of dicks. The younger people don't know what that is, but that's basically your networking. And so, you know, you get jobs, you get jobs, you get jobs. So I came home because Ron Harry was about to release some new contracts, made it top sides that he run, Muskrat Falls, right? And we do good work out west the work of our groups of ordinary people from this province, world class, the numbers better than anybody. I came home and I can't get a job because the contracts are going to uh, overcompensate and introvert, forgive the emotions. Uh, the contracts have been led to companies from outside and even though they're hiring the union members and the craft, rightly so, they're bringing their staff with them. And I can guarantee you when I work away, I pay my taxes there, and those people pay their taxes there. There's not a higher influence first in the staffing of any of these industrial jobs, so that's wrong. And one is that my scrap falls, reads like a bad Le novel. At a time when SNC Lavalin is being investigated for corruption, organized crime, and direct payoffs of $110 million in Quebec at a hospital, they get without tender. The, uh, the engineering, procurement, construction, and maintenance of a $10 billion project. So they, if you extrapolate the, the dough that they got to bribe people with, they would have had $100 million to bribe people with. And who does the general contract go to before the EPCM is pulled away from them? A Italian firm. My God. Never did a job in Canada before. You know, and I work with a lot of companies, but we're not up there. The people that are up there, the majority of them, the big money, is not staying here. So, you know, but on a, a, on a funny note, there's tens of thousands of jobs in alternative energy. The new industrial revolution is a green one. And we're the only province two years ago. Bill 61 needs to be amended. We need that many metering here. So we can put up new minutes and express that in the state. It is a new job for the country. It is the next industrial revolution. The solutions are out there. And when we stand together, we will win. And we're going to Woo! Some people are starting to drift away, so I'd like to. We've got three people remaining at the mics, then I suggest we wrap it up and I ask them to to uh, respect the time limit. Uh, Catherine, uh, you, uh, you're next. citizen who calls Newfoundland my home. And I have a question. I'm going to start with a question for the Liberals. Because, see, I only have a university degree, and I'm in, I'm in support, 
and I'm, you know, I have a disability and a woman, and I'm homeless, by the way, living in transitional housing. So I'm not as smart as the liberals maybe. So I just need some help understanding something here. Dwight Ball said, he said, you know, yeah, it was difficult decisions that had to be made, right? And uh, he said, and things were a lot worse than what we were made aware of. So he said, we didn't realize how bad things were until we got in there. So we had to break all of our promises. We had to hurt the people that are already hurting the most because we didn't know. Well, here's my question. The whole time they were opposition, the whole time that they were campaigning, they said to us, did they not? Or am I, am I missing something here? Did they say, don't trust the PCs? Don't believe the PCs? They're not honest. They're not transparent. But the one time that we needed to, they, they believed them, was about the de uh, uh, you know, the deficit? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like they actually believed them when it came to that. They didn't imagine it. Oh my God, they can't be telling us the truth now. Like, you know, they gotta be being honest now. Right? Because we didn't know how bad things were. But all the time, they were saying, don't believe them, don't trust them. So I, maybe, maybe liberals can answer that one for me. Um, I have another question. And I'm going to speak right now, if I can, just use up the rest of my time speaking from a different perspective here tonight. I want to know how many martyrs that this government expects that there will be to reduce the deficit. See, I remember the COD moratorium, and I remember the Canadian Mental Health Association doing this doing the research, and suicide rates spiked. And my husband was one of those victims. He was a martyr because of what happened back then. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm thinking, this is the worst that I remember since the Cod Moratorium in our times. And I'm thinking of migration. People who are have to feel they have to leave the province. People losing their jobs. Young people can't afford to go to school. Um, people going bankrupt. And people taking their lives. How is Kathy Bennett so confident that, oh, they're going to reach their goals? They're going to reduce this deficit. How with so many murders? It was people are dying, people can't pay, people are leaving home. It doesn't make any sense to me. But yet again, don't forget now, I'm only a woman. I'm a person with a disability, okay? I have a university degree, but I'm on income support, so I don't matter. So I don't, I'm not as smart as that. Right? Well, guess what? I don't care if you're a nurse. I don't care if you're a teacher. I don't care if you're an MHA or on income support. We are all human beings and none of us should be martyrs. None of us should be martyrs. And to bring, just to bring it to a close, I have so many points, but this, this one is very important. On a personal level, I'm a type one diabetic as well. I don't know, as of Saturday, Nobody knows what's happening with our diabetic supplies and income support. As a type one diabetic, if they don't, call, if I don't get help with my diabetic supplies, including my needles to take my insulin, it's a death sentence, people. We're not talking about a levy here for some people. We're talking about a life and death situation. And I'm not willing to lie down and take it. And I don't think anybody should. You're willing to fight against the levy. You're willing to fight for your jobs. We're out here fighting with you and for you. Then we're asking you for to do the same for us. Fight for the people on fixed incomes. Fight for the people with disabilities. Fight for the people that don't have a voice. Nobody should be a martyr for the justice that we did not create. Thank you.
thanks uh, for that, Catherine. Uh, straight from the heart. Uh, go ahead. My name is Tom James. I'm a federal civil servant. I'd like to purpose. I, 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 by the way, I joined the NDP yesterday. <laughs> I was active with you when I was in public service, but I wasn't active with any of the public, any of the parties. I always admired the NDP, but we haven't had a great deal of progress. You know, uh, it's the democratic process, the House of Assembly passes our laws and governs it. And unless we get in there and give them, not, not necessarily a majority, but a, a large enough opposition or, or we'll take the government one or the other, but unless we get that, uh, you know, we, we miss out on a lot of things of helping people. Now, uh, my own thoughts on this is that what we really need is what I say, what I call economic justice for all. Here, here. <laughs> we all have to varying degrees our own various problems, but unless we act as a group and get our message across in public, uh, it doesn't help the people. What, what I see when I talk about economic justice for all is there's the people who pay taxes, the most taxes, are the poor and the middle class, the wage earners. There are the majority of people who pay. The small business person pays in. But do you know there's 11 families in Canada that possess a hundred billion dollars of wealth. That's a B with a billion. If you go and look at the list, 11 families have wealth of 11 billion dollars. And that wealth, they spend, they take out millions of dollars a year in income, but they have sufficient billions to transfer to their children, and on it goes, and they control it, and they control it, and they control it. So, what you got to address is that situation, wealth and taxes. Now, they take out millions of dollars in taxes, but they will True lawyers, they write the laws. They write the laws, and you have legitimate tax avoidance. Why should there be limited tax? Why should there be tax avoidance? Just pay it. You have, you have, you have offshore <coughs> investments that are unknown to the government. It takes somebody in weekly weeks to discover that four trillion, that's what it achieved, four trillion dollars of wealth is in Orkney Island or some other place in the ocean. So these are the things that have to be addressed. And how can we address that? We can address it by getting our members in Parliament. And, we saw in, in a, uh, time is limited, and, uh, and I, I must say it was heartening and disheartening to be here at night. <laughs> heartening to see the people who are here, and very disheartening to hear the stories. Uh, I wouldn't concentrate only on that levy, because you know, for the poor, up to two hundred thousand dollars. We have five tax brackets so that you can get as much tax as possible. Each bracket increases. But when you reach 200,000, the tax rate is the same for the next hundred million dollars. It's also 
that there will be more time to talk about these things. But one thing I would advise is that you put the fire to the feet of the liberal members in the House of Assembly. When the House of they all lined up before the Lieutenant Governor. And what did they swear? They swore to, they swore to perform their duties to the House or to the people. They swore to perform their duties. And their duties weren't to follow the leader or follow the government, which is part of the Liberal Party. Their duties were to the people of the province and to their constituents. So I would like to think that if anybody thinks that that budget is what their constituency wanted, they can stay with the Liberals, but they should. If they believe in the people, they should walk across the house and set as an independent yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We have one more, uh, one more person on the mic, and then I'll do a, do a quick wrap-up. Um, I wanted to agree with that gentleman, because what would, be, what would happen if people started to switch over as an independent? That would not bring on a, another election. But what it would do, it would give us the opportunity to be able to rewrite the rules so that we would be able to take over the budget. So actually having people to go and sit as an independent, they don't have to sit under Lorraine Michaels or an NDP and sitting and putting them in a situation where the union would be, they wouldn't be able to fight the union and they would have to, they would have the opportunity to use the union to be able to even create more job losses based upon contracts that have them in situations that if they were to retire, that we're going to have up to 50% uh, based upon the money that would be spent would go into pensions because they can't afford to be able to have new people hired based upon old union contracts. Though we do need good quality of life for people, you still have to keep a good eye on that union. We need to be able to make sure that we have some power over the NDP and the union because they're, they're off both, they're the same puppet, which might not be a good thing. And um, I do have here um, some things that I'm after writing now. Everybody knows that I've gone door to door. I have thousands of signatures, which I'll give right now to Lori Michael. I have the other half for the federal ones. If you can give that to Jerry, because I got 600 votes. Now, um, I got 680 that uh, Jerry said that it wasn't going to be good enough. It was too, uh, it wasn't clear enough when it came to uh, the power weight of a particular petition. So that's 680 names that that means if your signature goes on there, they're starting right now with me almost every international law on human rights that has been used on me as a guinea pig happens to one person and you push that through. But that's how our country has been taken over. One person matters. One person, and we fight and making sure that quality of life goes on, starting from the very worst, the very most on life, the most on wanted. It's all up in gravy from there because at any time, most of you would be able to get that knock saying that you have to leave that house because you couldn't afford it, or the property tax went up and you lost your job, or they're gonna have to take it over because you couldn't pay your power bill. Really, if you think about it, most of you are only 18 months away from that. Some of you even less than three months. Yes, that's true. And if the housing market goes down, that's another situation where you're going to be indebted no matter where it is that you go. So homelessness is definitely in your future unless you really take over the union and start taking over that party, pushing for them to go sit as an independent so we can take back the rule of the house. And um, I also have uh, here is... Uh, Trying to get it down to the Newfoundland colors. <clears throat> All we need to do from K to 12, reality is not allowed to be talked about with our children. Then we had someone, I think she was pointing up here and she was crying about how she was a government worker and now all of a sudden this inclusiveness. Most people that I talk to, whether they're in the classroom, they're a helper in the classroom, or they do have there's some that do have children, this inclusive education is costing us our literacy because they need the proper services 
And our children need to be able to write down on a piece of paper or to be able to write what they need to write to save their future because we are raising a class of slaves and debit to debt thanks to Nelcor. I don't think people really realize just how much power that uh, they have been able to perverse the laws within our own house using our crown corporations and our own particular money to put you into a situation where you are a financial slave. Three and a half minutes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and this is all the, the way to be able to do it is in reality. The actual St. John's budget, the actual NELCOR budget, the actual federal budget printout, who reads it? Who's going to? This is where we need to get back to basics and what your real life power bill is, what your real life situation is, and that should not be, not you not be able to teach your own child that at home as some sort of pay it course home because we really need to get the education back into the house, but in real life terms. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your input tonight. Um, sobering, uh, sobering stuff for sure. Uh, I'm a believer that the brain can only absorb as much as the arse can endure, so I'll be, uh, I'll be brief at the end. But I did promise to touch on a, a question I was asked by several people beforehand, uh, which is, what would you do differently? Yes. Uh, now, I was asked on a an open line or a phone-in show that shall remain nameless uh, a couple of days ago, uh, whether we do a shadow budget. That's done federally. Uh, it's called the Alternative Federal Budget. It has a team of something like 40 or 50 economists that contribute to it and has enormous resources. We don't have that kind of resources. Uh, the, to, nor do we have the information, the full detailed information needed to fully uh, give an alternative budget. But I can say here are a few basic building blocks that we would have. Uh, I think the budget that was presented in the House of Assembly on the 14th of April was a real disaster for the working class and, and, and low income people who are struggling to get by, who got bills piled up on top of the fridge, wondering which one to pay next. It failed those people, in my opinion. And there are some things that we would do differently. I can, I can only touch on them for the most part in a kind of qualitative way, and I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I agree with one thing the Liberals said that the previous government left behind a mess. But that doesn't excuse a no jobs, no hope, no plan for rural Newfoundland and Labrador, anti-literacy, unfair levy, lower the boom budget that makes life totally unaffordable for so many people in our population. So what would we do differently? Well, I'd start by saying everything would not be on the table. That a budget that we brought in would be built around values and principles. And clearly articulated values at that. Things like a public health care system so people get looked after. Things like affordable post-secondary education. Things like respect and dignity for seniors and opportunities for youth and so on. We would do, in, in general principle, what the Alberta NDP did. We would invest in Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, invest in jobs. We'd replace the bogus consultations that were held over the, uh, the, this winter where people just, the very first question wasn't, you know, what are the programs and services and values that you hold most near and dear? It was, what would you cut first? That's some question to start with. And what we would do was give people information to make informed decisions. I bet you my bottom dollar that if the public of Newfoundland and Labrador were told that to take away the dental program from seniors who are living on the you know, on the, on the kind of edge of poverty, as, as someone said, not only seniors, but others uh, living with, you know, at or below the poverty line, to save, I think it's $3 million, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians in public consultations. Would you agree with that? Or would you pay, be willing to pay a little more to help those people? I believe the sharing principles of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, they would say, don't be so foolish to take that away from those people for a lousy $3 million. And if you ask... If you ask, would you shut down 54 libraries in this province, which are not just libraries, in many communities are social centers where little kids go for social activity, where seniors go for, for, to, you know, for a bit of a social life, that forms it, where, where meetings are held, the, the hub for the community. Would you close them down to save a lousy million bucks? No. no. 
Or would you pay a couple cents more, be willing to pay a couple cents more in income tax if you have, to have an income to pay it from to make that work? Yes. And I think I know what the answer would be there too. So we talk about taking out the bogus consultation, say here's what the real choices are. And ask people, this year we're putting $1.3 billion in, in, into Muskrat Falls. Do you think that's a good idea? No. But tell them what the, tell them what the real choices are. Or else don't have, don't pretend you're having consultations at all. It's just bamboos on people. We'd analyze the impact of the budget on people in different circumstances and at different income levels. We do that with a gender lens. We do that with a disability lens. We do that with a youth lens. We do that with a senior's lens. We would say we do that with a rural lens. So you don't just, it's not, a budget is not an accounting exercise. It's much, much more than a budget is about accounting. We'd scrap the letter. Yeah. 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 Now, I absolutely agree with Mr. James, who, spoke, who, who said, don't focus everything on the levy. I couldn't agree more. The levy is a heinous piece of business. They should be ashamed of themselves for bringing in, but there's a lot more in that budget that we have to zero in on as well. The yeah. levy is just the power of the single. If you could pick one most obnoxious aspect, that would probably qualify, but there are a lot of other things. So we can't get uh, just... Uh, focused on the levy. If we need to incorporate needed revenue into uh, personal income tax and corporate income tax structures. That's what they're there for. You don't need a barrage of fees and sand and levies. We put in a one and a half percentage point increase in the corporate income tax. Exactly. We cost that out in our federal campaign. We think that the, and this, uh, this does not apply to small business, but the corporate sector uh, can and should. They bore, they were some of the ones who were the greatest cheerleaders of the Muskrat Falls project. They were some of the biggest beneficiaries of the boom times. I think they can fit, pay their sh fair share of, of the tough times. <laughs> Replace that whopping fuel tax, which by the way has a disproportionate hit on people in rural Newfoundland and Labrador, especially now that half the offices up are being closed down, they gotta go even further to get to services, to get to a doctor, or to get to a you know, a, a government right. office or whatever, and replace that with a measured, balanced carbon tax that would only be arrived at following a, a full-fledged consultation with the public, giving them the various options with the costs and the benefits outlined. The minister announced, <laughs> proudly announced, that the government was investing $570 million in infrastructure projects. What she neglected to mention was that that's a reduction of $138 million from last year. At a time when there's layoffs in the private sector and we desperately need those projects to offset some of the downturn. And what we would do is at the very minimum reinstate that $138 million and probably more besides to put people to work so they're paying income tax, so they're buying stuff from the store, so the shopkeepers can, can keep people employed and so the wheels of the economy start to turn. We'd implement a fair tax review. That would take some time, but we would do it. We'd keep it, keep it simple. Not the absolute bombardment of tax measures that you need a Philadelphia lawyer to do out your income tax return if you're making $10,000. We'd review all government programs and services, not to find excuses to slash and privatize, but to redeploy resources to the highest priority areas. $2.7 billion, I believe, is an unsustainable level of deficit. I think measures had to be taken to bring that down, and in particular, revenue had to be raised, i.e. Tax, taxes increased to do it. We had uh, a reduction in taxes back in the, in the last decade that was completely unsustainable, and, and that, that created a lot of the problem. Having said that, there's nothing magic about $1.8 billion. We need a plan that offers hope to our people and that spurs economic activity to give meaning to that hope. And if that means a deficit somewhat higher than $1.8 billion, then that's what that means. And I'll tell you something else we would not do is send a message to every public sector worker in the province, you better sit in your wallet for the next six or seven months because you could be the next one out the door. Because we would realize that that's about the stunnest thing you could do in terms of, 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 of uh, shrinking the economy and slowing uh, economic activity down to a crawl. 
We would remove the privatization lens from public services. Yeah. Take away that. Yeah. And above all, we would do everything we could to restore hope in our people, to encourage young people to stay, to treat seniors with respect, and to harness the creativity and innovation of our people. So those are a few things. I thought that's not a detailed budget, line by line budget. It would take a lot more resources than we currently have to do it. But I think fundamentally a budget is about choices and values. Those are some of the choices and values we'd make to try and in, in, in what are admittedly, I agree there's difficult circumstances, but that doesn't mean you throw in the towel. That doesn't mean you say to the people with less and who are really struggling, here it's your problem, you deal with it. That doesn't mean you throw aside progressive taxation and sock it to the people who are least able to cope with it. So those are some of the values we get. There are, when the government says we had no choice, yes, Mr. Ball, yes, Ms. Bennett, you had a choice, you just made the wrong. So, so anyway, the, the night's been long. I thank everybody very much for coming, and, and especially the people who came up and uh, and, and uh, had their say at the mics. If anybody wants to have a chat afterwards, uh, by all means, uh, I'm game to stick around. I'm sure Lorraine and others are. And if anybody wants to get on a list for you know mailings, updates, information, and so on. And, and yes, at the rally on Friday that uh, that Adam spoke of earlier certainly encouraged people. There will be other rallies, other demonstrations. I think it's critical that people get some staying power here. Power here, stick in there. I think people are sincere in what they're saying. The only way we'll get any progress is if we if we keep up the fight. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I think we'll all do that. Thank you very much for coming out and, and for your time and your attention.